Thank you. It's great to see so many people here. This is a lot more people than usually show up for a physics talk. Um, so it's, it's wonderful to see the interest in this film where we'll learn a little bit more about the life of Hedy Lamarr. And you'll see in the film a little bit of uh, that tension of beauty and brains, this idea that uh, she's so beautiful, uh, people just took for granted that she, her, her existence somewhere was really to decorate the room, and there was no expectation that she has something intelligent to add to the conversation, or that she would even understand the conversation that's going on with her husband and his colleagues um, in Austria. So... Uh, it's an interesting question, right? What would uh, Hedy Lamar have uh, considered doing if she had uh, different educational opportunities, right? Uh, this day and age, there are many more possibilities for women to pursue an education in the sciences and engineering. Um, she is presented as an innovator, as an inventor, right? So she's an idea person. And if you have 200, 300 ideas and one of them is really, really good, that's actually not a terrible ratio, right? So in some ways, you know, would, would she have pursued engineering? Would she have pursued science? Um, would she have been an entrepreneur, right? It sort of feels like that more to me, and you can, you can decide for yourself what you want to imagine her life might have been like. Um, but the entrepreneur who gathers together the people who might have different education in um, science and engineering and really put an idea together to make it happen. Um, perhaps a more interesting question is what would she have done if she wasn't so beautiful, right? Um, beauty certainly helps launch a, a career on the stage. Um, is beauty advantageous in all fields? So there's definitely psychology literature that took, looks at the advantages of being attractive versus unattractive, right? You get treated differently if you're unattractive. You get treated differently if you're attractive. Um, it's beneficial in life to go through life being a more attractive individual. There is one study that I could find that tried to answer this question in the sciences, right? Is it better to be attractive in the sciences or not? And what they found was that somebody who is attractive is deemed more interesting to talk to and less competent, <laughs> right? So if you're trying to launch your YouTube channel to talk about science, you wanna be attractive and get people to want to listen to you. If you want them to take you seriously after you've attracted them, maybe you wanna dress it down and decide to be less attractive. So, uh, you know, that's a study. It's not the most compelling study. You know, you, we, can, we can think more about it. Not everyone is studying whether or not you should be an attractive scientist to get ahead in your career. Um, so, uh, it's an interesting uh, question though, right? Like when you are a member of a visually distinct underrepresented group, like women in physics, women in science, I think it's very natural to try to uh, uh, control the way that you look in the ways that you can, right? To, to dress down, to perhaps dress more masculinely if you're in an area that is more masculine. Um, now, I should, I should admit that I am someone who in grad school maybe was being hit on in the T-stop um, on the red line, uh, where what he started with was, do you study the natural sciences? And I'm like, oh crap, what am I wearing? Um, <laughs> all right, you know, the answer, the answer is hiking boots, jeans that don't fit particularly well, a university t-shirt and a flannel in 2002. So uh, I was on the red line, right? Harvard and MIT are on the red line, so that was a decent, decent guess on his part. We, of course, then proceed to have a conversation where he shows me um, Maxwell's equ equations tattooed on his bicep in vector notation and tensor notation. So uh, this is all after he put aside his Wired magazine that he was reading to have this conversation with me. Um, so I, I now try a little bit harder to break stereotypes because I think it's important to break stereotypes. Of course, I put more stress into what I was going to wear tonight than what I was going to say tonight, but that's a different situation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so it's something where now when I get into those dreaded random conversations with people um, on the airplane, you get to the, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a physicist. Now, what do you think I get after that? There's really only three responses. One, oh, you don't look like a physicist. <laughs> Thanks. You don't look like someone who's intentionally trying to perpetuate stereotypes. You know, what, what else do you get? Oh, I hated physics. Well, that one I can handle a little bit more. You didn't, uh, you didn't have a good teacher, you know. What were your experiences? Oh, yeah, we don't do that anymore. At least I don't do that in my classes. Um, or you get, oh, you must be smart. <laughs> well, I don't know what the correct answer is to that. Yes? Uh, yes, go run away and cower before I, you know, threaten your fragile ego. <laughs> um, you know, or like, oh, thanks, no, really anyone can be a physicist if, they, if they're interested and work really hard, which I do believe, right? Anyway, I digress. Um, 
So uh, let, let's talk a little bit more about uh, perceptions of physicists and scientists, right? What is it that a scientist is supposed to look like? You know, how do we fit that pattern? How do we answer this question? Well, one thing we can do is go to Google, and we can ask Google to do an image search of scientist. And I have to say, I thought this looked great. I think I did this like five years ago and it didn't look this good. Um, but what do you see? You see people wearing goggles, some crazy hair. They're surprisingly young. They look all very posed to me. Um, there's some diversity. Uh, there's some women. But look at the top. The second suggestion of how to refine your, change your search is female, right? This is saying the default is male. Do you want to search for female scientists? That's a different set of images. So that's scientist. What about biologist? Uh, there are actually more women in these images than men. Uh, you still have females, an option at the top. Uh, they're doing a little bit more variety of things. There's still a lot of lab coats. There's handling beakers and fluids. Uh, there are people outside studying plants and animals. What about physicist? Well, that's different. Um, apparently, physicists just stand in front of chalkboards. Uh, that one looks different. That one looks posed. This says, what does a physicist do? So this is about the jobs, your career interest. So that's that. Um, that's Jenny. I know Jenny. Um, I actually started just Googling female first names and physicists to see how often I knew someone in the first hit, and it was surprisingly often. Um, so, so that's physicists. Um, notice also the age of the average person in these photos and that the women are the young ones, which actually might be realistic. Um, I did search engineer, and I thought it was hilarious they all had hard hats on. Uh, I know a lot of engineers, none of them wear hard hats. Um, so I guess engineers wear hard hats and look at diagrams. And they're all, how old do they all look? They all look the surprisingly same age. Um, so that's interesting. There's a couple women. Um, I tried computer scientist. Um, programmer was more depressing than this. Um, so uh, I'm not going to count that one over there. I don't know what that is. Uh, but there's you know, one female presenting image in this, in this batch. Um, and computer scientists look at computers and touch hardware. So that's maybe reasonable. Um, I tried Inventor. One thing you need to know about Inventor is that there is a very well-known um, CAD program, computer-aided design program, called Inventor. So I tried Inventor Human, and that gave me lots of images of humans. So I tried Inventor Person. So this is what comes up with Inventor Person. Um, it looks like entirely men to me, but this is the conceptualization of Inventor. But these aren't necessarily unrealistic. It might not be what we want to see when we make the, put these searches in. But how many women are in these fields? And one of the, the ideas I want you to walk away with is the different fields are very different, right? So you're looking at the green line is biological sciences. Uh, up around 60% of bachelor's degrees, undergraduate degrees, are going to women. Chemistry is a bit under 50%. Math and stats has been taking a downward turn, but it's still between 40 and 50. Um, this is only since 1985. Um, computer science took a big dip after the dot-com boom, and computer science, physics, and engineering are all hovering below 20%. Depending on how you label computer science, you get even lower percentages. Is IT in it? Is IT not in it? Um, the left is still the same data without computer science because uh, this is, these plots are the same otherwise. And it goes back to 1967. So you can really see a huge difference as women entered these fields. And, you know, even when there's only 20% women in the field, it's been that way for like two decades. It hasn't changed that much. Now, you might want to ask, well, what happens at the PhD level, right? People who are going to become, uh, you know, the educators at university, um, because those are role models for people who are entering college. Um, the interesting thing is the lower the percentage of bachelor's degrees, the more of them that persist. So you actually still get about 20% PhDs in physics and engineering but you see drop-offs in, drop in all of the other fields. So the problems that are facing uh, women in biology are different than the problems facing women in physics. In physics, if you can convince a woman that she's interested in it and wants to major in it in college, she has the same likelihood of persisting as a man. Doesn't mean her experience is the same, but that she sticks it out and continues to succeed and get to higher levels at the same rate as men do. And in biology, you see um, drop-offs throughout the career. So you would expect to have different interventions be more effective in these different fields. So there's a test out there, uh, a research tool, that's called Draw a Scientist Test. And you ask kids to draw a scientist. And these are the types of drawings that you see. Um, 
And it's interesting to think if I was asked to draw a scientist, what would I draw so that someone could tell I was drawing a scientist? Um, but what recently came out in about December, this past December, December 2018, was a meta-analysis study, which means they took all of the studies, which started from drawings in the 1960s and 70s, and looked at a lot of studies since then, um, and tried to say, well, have the drawings of scientists from, by kids changed over the years? And the answer is, well, yes. So this is the study, if anyone wants to go look it up. So what did they see? Well, compared to the 60s and 70s, 60s and 70s, kids draw more female scientists now than before. Now, unfortunately, it was a little bit hard to say if throughout the 80s, 90s, and into the 2000s, if it continued to increase, it probably did, but the statistical power wasn't quite there. Um, an interesting and a little bit disturbing, or at least informative piece of information is older kids draw more male scientists, right? So girls begin drawing more male than female scientists around age 10 or 11, and by age 16, they're drawing three times as many male scientists as female scientists. Compare this to, to boys. Uh, boys change from drawing 83% male scientists at age six to 98% at age 16, right? And it's worth knowing, so if you just ask a kid to draw basically a person, um, over 70% of the time, they'll draw a person that's the same sex as they are. Um, so you would expect about 70% of girls to draw girls, 70% of boys to draw boys if you asked randomly. If you ask like, you know, uh, late elementary, middle school to draw vets or teachers, you'll see more women. So it's not just a bias towards drawing men. It really is something about drawing a scientist that's going on here. So what else do we learn? Um, we learn that older kids are more likely to draw scientists with glasses or goggles and lab coats. Now, overall, 50% of the drawings across every age and all decades have lab coats, and 38% have eyeglasses or goggles because scientists apparently wear glasses. Um, they do wear goggles when they're doing certain things. It's good to know that the kids are we're aware of safety, protective, personal protective equipment, at least. Um, and in later decades, scientists were more often drawn outside and not just in the lab. Um, overall, 78% were drawn indoors or in a laboratory. So what is this telling us? This is telling us something about the perception of what a scientist is and or what a kid thinks a scientist is and what a scientist does. And that is part of the predictors of whether or not someone's going to become a scientist, right? So if you think a scientist mixes colored liquids in beakers and wears goggles and sits at a computer, and that doesn't sound like fun to you, then you're not gonna wanna be motivated to study in that direction. Science is also very hierarchical, so while you can, it's never too late to learn what you need to know to go into these fields, it's a lot easier if you learn it along the way and you get to college with a strong preparation from high school. So, um, you know, are things changing or not? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. My niece is a great example. So my niece has Aunt Kathy, who's a physicist, and mom, who is also a physicist. My sister is a physicist at University of Michigan. So uh, she, at age four, said, oh, can only girls become scientists? <laughs> and her mom said, oh, no, boys can also grow up to become scientists. It's fine. You know, anyone can become a scientist. Um, which is a little weird because her dad's basically a scientist, too, but he's technically an engineer, so maybe she was making a distinction, but um, I'm not sure. Um, but what does it say? It says she's, she's processing the world by gender, right? She also got confused because in her father, in her family, um, dad does all the cooking. And so she was confused when grandma went to the kitchen to cook because, you know, dads and grandpas should be cooking and moms and grandmas aren't supposed to be in the kitchen. So on the one hand, it's great. She's learning these delightfully reverse stereotypes. But on the other hand, it's still this idea that gender is so incredibly uh, salient as a sorting category for what is an appropriate thing to do. Um, you know, when people ask me why, uh, how my sister and I both became physicists, it is pretty unusual. And seeing my father interact with her son as the older one, so when he was two, so like barely talking with any words, um, the grandpa and grandson were in the other room playing with a big cardboard box, right? Big cardboard boxes are lots of fun. You can play with them. They had balls. So they'd put a ball on one side and raise, the, raise that side. It would go rolling down to the other side. My nephew figured out how to put it on his side, raise it up, rolls back down. Grandpa's talking the whole time. We don't really know what's going on in that room. He comes back to the adult room and says, oh, we just covered the inclined plane. <laughs> Wanders back in. You put a ball and a block on the, the, the big box. You raise that side. Which one starts going down first? The ball, because rolling friction is smaller than sliding friction. Comes back, oh, we just covered friction. It's like, oh my God, this is how my sister and I were raised. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's something to be learned from that, right? Like, 
careful, you might get rebellion from your kids instead. Um, but we, I think, just learned to interpret the world around us and had explanations and had that advantage in school because we were already thinking about these things and being given often age-inappropriate vocabulary. Um, but we were learning the vocabulary nonetheless. Um, why is the sky blue? Because of um, wavelength-dependent scattering. Thanks, Dad, I'm five. Um, <laughs> I know what it means now, but I didn't at the time. Um, so uh, so it's, it's interesting to think about what goes into it. We joke about renting him out now that he's retired, if anyone wants him to play with your children. <laughs> but, but I digress. Um, so uh, back to the, the story of Hedy Lamar. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about anything you would like to talk about. Um, I think there are a lot of interesting questions about perceptions of scientists and invention um, and the roles that women are, are, are pushed into in society. Um, and with that, I thank you for your attention and please enjoy. Thank you.